Okay. And ready to go? All right. Uh, oh. One second. <laughs> Sorry. <Sure. laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're live. Fantastic. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Blick Art Materials Facebook Live Takeover. Uh, uh, I'm Todd with Blick Art Materials. Um, my guest today is painter and art historian Jenya Gershman. Um, give you a little bit of background about Jenya because she is so uh, phenomenal. She is an internationally renowned painter of the human condition. Uh, her primary focus is portraiture in the human form with elements of expressionism and mysticism woven in. Uh, she was born in Moscow and held her first solo exhibition at age 14 in her home country. That's just stu stunningly young. Uh, she, came, uh, she later came to the United States and attended the Art Center uh, College of Design, earning her Master of Fine Arts degree. Uh, since then, she has achieved a widesp widespread recognition in large exhibitions throughout the United States, uh, including Art Chicago, which is right in Blick's backyard in Chicago. Uh, and has created multiple portraits of some of the 20th century's most influential music artists. Uh, that includes Bruce Springsteen and Bob Dylan. Uh, those were for the Music Harris Grammy Foundation. Um, she's also an educator. Uh, she uh, has founded her own art center, the Z Art Academy, uh, where she teaches artists of all ages how to build up their repertoire of painting and skill with other mediums. Uh, they work from live models. They have portfolio reviews, exhibitions, and much, much more. Uh, she also holds recognition as an art historian, as mentioned, um, with the discovery of a previously unknown Rembrandt self-portrait in his painting, Danae, uh, her account of which was published by Ariane at Boston University. So uh, it's with great pleasure that I welcome Jenya to the Facebook Live takeover today on this Facebook page. Thank you so much, Jenya, for being here, and I am so excited to talk to you and hear all about your uh, your travails through the painting process and, and your history. and. Uh, see you actually do some live painting for us. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to being here. I actually feel like it's really happening, not just in my studio, but the connection with the great audience that Blick has. You have such a great following, such support and such interest and enthusiasm. So thank you for everyone who's watching. And thank you, Todd, for a beautiful uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to welcome once again, everyone to my studio. We'll talk a little bit um, and after not too long, we're going to jump into the actual portrait painting demonstration. I know that uh, Blake has um, promoted it and said something about um, Jenny will show you how to capture the soul. So I'm going to take you up on this and uh, I'm going to show you some tricks. Uh, I'm going to reveal some of my secrets today. Well, that's a, that, I mean, that's great. And it is so true. I mean, looking through your work, it's just got such a life to it. Uh, you have a, a fantastic ability to capture it not only the likeness of the individual that you're painting, but also uh, your paintings really do seem alive. I mean, the, the texture in your work and the color that you combine in it, it, it really is phenomenal. You do some some pretty interesting things and, and we can even see some of them behind you. Um, so I'm gonna turn on a little bit of a PowerPoint so you can see a little bit closer. So share a screen, bear with me for one moment. Share. And I think you should be able to see this right now, correct? Yeah, we do. That's so great. This is a little bit more formal uh, side of my studio, which is right behind me. You're going to see it, a glimpse of it when I'm later painting in a camera from a different angle. Uh, I just wanted to show you the scale of my work. Um, as uh, Todd had mentioned, the soul, the presence of the human being is really what I'm interested in. And I think when you enlarge the portrait, somehow uh, by shrinking the audience, by us becoming smaller, we can crawl into the crevices of the soul and feel it more intensified. So I'm going to take you inside my studio. One second. Well, it really is so interesting. I mean, looking at your work at that scale, um, you're able to really dive into the architecture of the, the human anatomy. Um, it's, it's really interesting how you're building the form and sort of reveling in those those little intricate folds and crevices in the skin. Um, I, I really do love looking at the, at the variety of pieces I've seen from you. Now it's going. OK, great. <laughs> so um, I took you inside and I took you back in time. Uh, this is actually me um, when I am about 10 years old. 
Um, I'm actually younger here than my, my 12 year old daughter who's watching upstairs. Uh, hi, Nika. Um, and um, I got a question. Um, Blake was so kind to uh, reach out to the audiences and ask what they're interested, what they'd like to hear. Uh, so one of the questions was how I got started. And I just wanted to show that I came from a different world. Uh, this is a black and white world of Soviet Union. And even though this is a black and white photograph, our world was very much black and white. Everything was gray and drab. Uh, we didn't even have t-shirts. We didn't have bright, bright colors. Um, everything was gray. The weather was gray. The mood was gray. The politics was gray. And there was a lot of gray newspapers um, that if you touched was such bad print that it will cover your body and your face and your hands with transferring the uh, the news, right? The fake news. Um, so it was kind of interesting. That, that was the true fake news, uh, not to get into the politics. But um, here I am actually lying down because I don't have my first easel yet and um, I'm setting up my studio on the floor. I always wanted to paint large. So my parents are allowing me to take over the carpet and their beautiful living room and just spread out and put a huge sheets of uh, white paper and paint and draw whatever I please. Uh, so this is where it all started. Now what first drew you to painting, Jenya? Uh, so uh, I always, whenever I give an interview, I, I bring in my mom into the mix because it was my mom really who brought the love of art for me and for everyone in our family. And she dragged me, um, I can't say that I went enthusiastically to the museums from very young age, but uh, pretty soon that changed around. Well, her little trick was to give me a very yummy sandwich that she could only give to me after two hours of careful watching the oh, art. There you go, smart. <laughs> and there was, yeah, there was, <laughs> it was great mom. And uh, there was one day where I no longer went for the sandwich. I kind of remember, you know, I went for the, the art became the nourishment, the art became the food. And um, of course, all of the great artists that I saw in the Russian museums, that there were fantastic traveling exhibitions uh, in Moscow. Uh, Francis Bacon show came through, uh, Picasso, I mean, wonderful impressionist. We saw so much. Um, and uh, seeing all the oil paint, all the oil painters and how different they were, it really mesmerized me that when you look at El Greco paintings, oil paint does not look the same as when you look at Manet painting. How is that possible? What is the magic? And I wanted to know the secret. I wanted to be in on the club. And I right away knew that I wanted to paint with oil. That was just immediate for me. Right, yeah. Um, and, and oil painting uh, or painting itself runs in your family, right? Uh, you have uh, an aunt who was uh, also a painter, and I think this might be her, her sketchbox easel right here. Exactly. So my, my aunt, Yelena Matusovska, uh, was incredible, incredible artist, poet, and art historian. And I'm going to tell you a couple of things about her in a moment. Uh, but she had passed away very, very young at the age of 33. And I was only four years old. And I inherited some things from her. Um, one of the things that I inherited is her art history book collection. So I used to look through her books and wondering about what she, her eyes looked at. What did she love? And ex exactly around 10 years old, when I started painting, um, I rummaged through an attic uh, in a uh, little home, uh, my grandparents' home. And there were so many things. And I just want you to imagine the smell of this attic. I mean, they had things from World War II in there, you know, just piled up. And I saw this box. This box was closed. It's a frame easel right has the legs on the other side that, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. come out and I didn't even know how to open it because it has so many screws and so many things and eventually I figured out how to open it and when I opened it right now it's empty because I used it all up but it used to have a collection of oil paints that were half squeezed um, there was a painting medium and brushes and there was that palette that I uh, put in the slide for you because I carry this magic box with me everywhere and my aunt was gone you know she was already six years pa past uh, and I looked at her paints but they were still fresh the paints were still alive and it was like she was there there was a little canvas there a canvas board and it's like she was talking to me over my shoulder and you know I saw that little container where I poured the turpentine and I dabbed my brush and I put the white where the white looked and the black where the black should go and I made my first painting so she was my first teacher I mean, certainly, you know, just capturing that spirit and bringing it into your work. I, I mean, it just seems like that's something that's been a current in your work throughout throughout your, your entire career. You're sort of building on that idea of 
capturing the spirit of the individual and, and putting it in the in the portrait. Same thing here. You have this uh, uh, family member whose spirit was was sort of right there, and and you were able to to hone in on that. That's so and I would say she just wasn't wasn't there. She is here, and hopefully that you'll feel her today as, a little bit as well. Next week, um, in just a few days, on August twenty eighth, she would have turned seventy five, and our family is trying to honor and celebrate her. So just very quickly, I wanted to show you what she looked like, and um, this is her name, uh, Liana Mutusovska, and she's here with one of the greatest yes one of the greatest painters who ever lived uh, especially in america uh, in 20th century andrew wyeth so he's a known recluse and wouldn't see any journalist but he agreed to see lena and absolutely was taken with her brilliance so i just want to show you something uh, this is a letter that he wrote to her and here you could see in 79 my dear lena uh, Miki sent me the wonderful photographs of taken of us together when you were here at Chatsworth. What a remarkable young lady you are. And um, let's see, you were, I, I wish you were around long enough for me to make your portrait uh, uh -huh. with, with that beautiful black hair and such eyes and along with all those qualities is your sharp mind. What a pleasure to talk with you. Please return wow. to America. Blessings, Andy. Um, what unfortunately, a what a wonderful artifact of that. Right. Time. That's wonderful. So unfortunately, that letter got too late to Russia when she had passed, but it became a relic for our family. And in the middle here, I show you the portrait that I made of her. Uh, and Andrew Weiss did not get a chance since she did not live, but I made a posthumous portrait recently um, of Liana. So I just wanted to honor her and, and do a shout out uh, to my family. That's great. And uh, okay, so we here we have uh, Baba's hand. Um, so this is this is a, uh, a really interesting thing because you use your grandmother as a regular model throughout the course of, of especially your, your early uh, pieces. Tell us a little bit about that. What, what drew you to your grandmother as a model? And, um, you know, what uh, made you continue to come back to her? She's definitely a muse for you. Absolutely. So Baba, as we all called her, uh, my grandmother, um, her name was actually Zhenya. I was named after her. Um, so already I had this amazing connection with her um, because see, seeing her as my as my goal to grow up into somebody like her because what her huge talent was, um, she gave hope to people. She was a muse. When, when you were in her presence, you felt a better person. And when she was looking and talking to you, nothing else existed. Everything stopped. It didn't matter if you were the milkmaid, a plumber, or a poet. Uh, my grandfather was a very famous poet. And if his friends who were extremely famous came over, she would stop equally for anybody of any walks of life and made them feel the most important. So she allowed me to paint her for years and she allowed me to see her a process of aging through my portraits. Mm -hmm. Here's actually a portrait of her hand and this is done long time ago. I just wanted to put it in there from 1995 and uh, she had very arthritic hands because she used to wash her hands with snow during World War II in the front and she also had this ring that wouldn't come off her hand. It just became part of her anatomy and so just to paint her hand was as if to paint her face her presence uh, but this is another painting a uh, much later so this is from 2014 and it's a mm -hmm. yeah i was going to say just look at that scale um that's that's you in the bottom left corner correct? that's me yes i'm just yeah. standing there to to show you uh just how large this oil painting is um and here's my grandmother with my then uh, I think seven-year-old daughter and I witnessed this moment uh, we visited my grandma a lot and they become great friends with my daughter and my daughter was whispering some kind of a secret to my grandmother and my grandmother was receiving it I couldn't tell what it was but I witnessed this mysterious moment and I wanted to paint it uh, to kind of gift the secret to the viewer to have that connection if they had that connection with their parent or grandparent or if they could imagine having it this very empowering moment of generations exchanging their wisdom and knowledge wow. The audience would probably like to know how you build the texture into your pieces. Um, you know, something that is pretty profound, and this is especially a, a great piece that shows it. You not only uh, kind of hinge your, your strokes in those uh, uh, crevices and folds that happen, 
within the skin, but you also then add additional texture through uh, and the implementation of some different uh, art tools. I wonder if you might be able to tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely, and today is uh, show and tell. So not only I'm gonna tell you about it, but I, uh, in a moment, I'm actually gonna show you how I create this. And in order to uh, get you a little bit closer to that painting, I'm going to show you a detail. Um, I use, um, let's see, I use these Princeton brushes, Princeton's tools that are made out of rubber and they have a really ability to bend, but also to grab. I'm going to bring it really close to the edge. Right, they have you a can serrated see the texture. Yeah. Um, and um, with that tool, you're able to manipulate way, uh, paint in many different ways. So I was actually thinking about how best to describe it, and I came up with an abbreviation for face, because this is what I'm really doing, the face of the model, the face of the soul, the face of the painting. And uh, what can you do with this? Uh, with this tool, uh, face, F for face, uh, formation. You can actually form the paint by grabbing and pulling it around. It builds up a really texture, amazing texture, just like palette knife, but larger passages. Uh, a in the face is for apparition because you can actually create really uh, blurry and um, mysterious passages where things look like almost disappearing. Uh, the C in the face is for capturing because I truly believe that this tool allows you to capture more than just the surface, to go deeper. And the E in the face is for excavation because lastly, if you dig in really deeply into it, it becomes almost like an etching technique, like in printmaking. And you're actually not adding, but removing the texture, going deep into the layers of the paint and the sole. That, that makes perfect sense. Uh, we have our first question from the audience. So I'd oh, like yes. to kind of shoot that out to you. Uh, Amy wanted to ask about impasto techniques. Um, she asks, can you only use impasto techniques with oil or can you use acrylic with a thickening agent? And, and obviously this kind of applies as we're talking here, you're painting a lot of wet and wet here. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, impasto and how you work uh, in oils with it and uh, what you might suggest for someone painting uh, that way with acrylics. So first of all, thank you, Amy. And uh, just to, for everybody, the impasto is a fancy way of saying thick layers of paint. And it comes from the word pasta, paste, just like the pasta that we eat. And the person who really popularized this technique was Rembrandt. Uh, so every time we do an impasto painting, we're actually in great conversation uh, with Rem, Rembrandt. And I think you could probably see my apron here. And you're, um, you're, you're a Rembrandt uh, uh, spokesperson as well. Yes, I'm very proud to have joined uh, Royal Talents North America for uh, specifically for Rembrandt Paint as the ambassador, 2020 uh, ambassador. So it's been a wonderful journey. So I want to thank them um, again and just give them a shout out. So impasto, you can build it up with just about anything, but the real trick, Amy, is actually not the agents of the paint that you're using, but the kind of surface you're using. So if you buy the canvas straight from the store without gessoing it, probably the impasto is not going to work as well um, unless you've added layers of gesso. So here I have actually Royal Talents um, Amsterdam uh, gesso uh, and it comes in white. I have it in white. I have it in transparent and I have it in black. So before I paint, uh, this is actually not very glorious, but extremely important. I create three layers of gesso on my canvases. Each one needs a few hours to dry in between. Um, you can create real, actually, impasto layers with the gesso itself. So before you even go in with your oil or acrylic, the, the texture will appear there. The gesso is very malleable. And the last layer that I do, I actually add a tint to my gesso, so I never start with a white white uh, intimidating canvas. So I prefer a kind of a neutral. I add a little bit black to my white and make beautiful pearlescent gray backgrounds or I can make a little bit more um, brownish uh, tones. I, sometimes I go wild and I use the red or blue and bright gessos as well. You don't want to use acrylic for this to substitute the gesso because gesso has a different tooth and the oil paint uh, will ad adhere to it in a much more beautiful way than going over acrylic. Uh, yes. But both 
it is acrylic gesso. It dries very fast. You could use it both with oil and with acrylic on top. Um, and that's how you begin to build your impasto. It just will, the paint will rise straight on it. It's not going to go absorbing and getting lost in the tooth of the canvas. So this, I would say, is a million dollar advice because a lot of artists uh, skip that step without knowing what a great benefit it brings. That, that's great advice. And, and it's also something to note that gesso can be sanded as well. Yes. So uh, that's one of the differences between it and, and the paints that we use. This is where your personality will come out. Not in painting, it's in gessoing. Because some people obsess with getting it just smooth and send it so it looks like glass. And it will affect the way your painting will look. And others like really rough texture and brush strokes showing through. So even in this seemingly boring step, you can't hold back your enthusiasm and your personality. And for me, it's a meditating stage when I just so it's like creating an environment for the person to come in. So I put all of my energy, I put on beautiful music. I don't see it as a waste of time. It's not glorious, but it's really necessary. That's such great advice. Thank you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you choose your models. Um, ah, it's, uh, um, let's, uh, let's talk about that. So, um, I have a slide for any possible question you might ask. Huh. Uh, so um, it, the choosing of the models is extremely easy. It just has to be a person who's willing to share. And mm. you know it when you go to the party, when some people, you know you can approach them, you don't know who they are, but you can approach them and you're not gonna be burned and hurt and you feel like they're almost like a kindred spirit without ever saying hello to them. And you go across the room and you just felt that energy. So the model projects that energy through their body, through their being, through the way that they're open to the world. And then there's others who are very closed and wear their interior world inside them locked away. It's not good or bad, it's just the ones, that's how we decide on who my model is. And here I wanted to show you Mark Snyder. Mark, if you're watching, uh, hello again. Uh, we've been working for 20 years and there's actually a film about us, about our working relationship, which is called um, The Model's Artist. Instead of the artist model, it's the model's artist uh, because I, we have a very interesting collaborative relationship, um, unlike uh, most traditions where uh, the model come in and the artist tells them what to do. Uh, we really create together. And so here he's sitting in front of his portraits. He modeled for this life and you can see his uh, large hands that are little hands compared to the painting. Um, this is a almost mural size work. And you have so many paintings of Mark. Uh, just looking on your website alone was just, it was uh, overwhelming how many different uh, varieties of paintings you have of this one model. He definitely is a muse for you. He, he's incredible and my, my students are blessed and cursed because they all have to learn how to paint and draw Mark. So whether they like it or not, they have to fall in love. And I also wanted to mention that today I, I chose, a, uh, I thought a lot about whom I'm going to paint uh, and how, uh, what portrait I should bring to life. Um, so I chose a very interesting person, is actually an artist. Um, and his name is uh, William Hemmerdinger. Um, he's a really incredible artist. If you look up his work, um, had a very uh, interesting illustrative career. And you'll see his face oh, and it has so much narrative in it. And I'm hoping that the magic will happen. We never know, but uh, that's the reason that I chose him because he's so open and really his face is like a book. Wonderful, that's, that's really great. Can't wait to see that. Uh, tell us, tell us any, anything else you wanted to and then let's get right to, the, to making the work. Okay, so maybe I'll go back just for a second. And I have a slide here of Rembrandt. And the reason I have this slide is because often I hear a question, why do I paint um, age or aging or wrinkles? Uh, especially being in LA in the city of Botox and beauty and uh, uh, where the face is so important, right? Why do I go to the other extreme? And um, the one to blame is really not me, it's Rembrandt. Him and his buddy Levens, when they were only in their 20s, uh, truly invented uh, the genre. Until then, it wasn't popular to draw all age. And they felt that when you look at a person who's lived, that their life shows through the wrinkles like a map. 
and that becomes much more interesting to capture. So here I show you, um, it's a very young Rembrandt. He's about 26 when he made this. So he's a young man. What does he care about the old age, right? But he is looking for that kind of lived life. And on the right, you see his drawing. And on the left, you actually see his etching that he's made after the drawing. That's why it's in reverse. And it's even tripled the amount of wrinkles. Even the clothing has the wrinkles and the etching and these lines. And the story, the way it projects, even when it's a tiny little drawing, the power is immense. So uh, this is what I'm, this is a tradition that I don't try to imitate. By no means I could never paint like Rembrandt, but the traditions that I'd love to see myself as part of celebrating the life lived. Now, we do have another uh, question from one of our audience members. Uh, Margo writes in, uh, typically, how long does it take to finish one of your pieces? And I, and I think she might be referring to one of your large scale pieces because they are so, uh, so uh, dominating in the gallery. T okay. Tell us a little bit about how long it takes you to, to get through that. So, so um, I'm going to give a long answer and a short answer. The short answer, it takes a few hours. The long answer is, um, there is no time when you paint. And any painter who's ever tried to paint, doesn't matter if you've painted your whole life or a little bit or you're just a kid, you know that you lose track of time. And sometimes you're able to do in one hour, human hour, right? So much that you could never have done in your whole life. Uh, there's some kind of speed of light traveling that happens when you create art. I think it's the same for musicians, uh, for people who write, for all creatives. And um, I just wanted to say that art is atemporal. And um, so I cannot boast, I can't take any credit and say, oh, hey, I did that in 12 hours, because I think it could have been five lifetimes. Um, the other way to say it is when we uh, have a child, and as women, we of course relate to this, um, there is a gestation period. We carry the child for nine months. The actual labor process is just a few hours. How long did it take? Did it take five hours? Or did it take nine months, five hours? So with painting, we also carry the idea. I think, uh, Todd, you will relate um, that we carry it for a long time and then it spews out fast like a birth. But oh, the so, process uh, is slow. Certainly. And, and you also have to take into consideration the, the process that the artist had to do to get to that point, right? I, you know, something about your work is that it kind of has a timeless quality to it, but you put so much effort into your pieces over the years that, you know, that experience sort of allows you to create something in, in perhaps a shorter period of time. But how can we really say that it was only that period of time because you have such a background in, in building these, these fantastic. And, but I would even add art. to it when you are carrying, when you carrying an idea, whether it's a portrait or an abstract painting or landscape, when you are eating, when you're sleeping, you still, at least for me, I'm still always absorbed in that work. So do we count that or do we just count the, the actual make, making? So for my students, I always encourage them to think that once you're an artist, the art making, the actual process is almost less significant than your living. Your life and how you live it, how you observe, how you train your eye, how you pay attention is the painting. So that's really important to me. So, so I hope I, I answered that that well. Great. Should we go to the to the demonstration? I, I think we should. I think I think our audience would love to see you get to work and and see what your palette looks like and uh, you know see some strokes get on the canvas. That that's great. All right. So I'm going to shift to show you first my palette. Okay, some magic over here. Now it's right. gonna it's gonna kind of focus in here, everyone. So there it is. Good. There All we right. go. So um, the way that I like to lay out my palette is very traditional, actually, but there are some variations for different artists. Um, this is my house trick. I don't know if you do this, but I like to put my whites sometimes in my lights a few times. This is a very helpful tip, uh, tip because as your white will become contaminated, you'll always have one that's clean and your white will become contaminated. What a good tip. And you're going to use that repeatedly in the painting. That's wonderful. Exactly. So the colors that I know I'll use and need over and over again. So you could actually see my ultramarine blue here. Um, is also repeated twice because I'll need a little bit of that darkness. I don't want to dilute it. So uh, that's why it's here twice. The ochre is here twice. The colors that I know I'll need less 
um, are in single batch. And the way I like to think about my palette, uh, some people like to separate it into translucent and opaque colors. I prefer to separate it into warm and cool. And I think about it as a light traveling throughout the day, starting with the sunrise and a kind of early light and going into the mid afternoon uh, sunset and cooling off. So there's a kind of a already a spiritual process happening. Um, if you are ever in the Catholic cathedral when you travel in Europe, like the, uh, the, the cathedral of Notre Dame, uh, the stained glass is actually arranged that way. So as the sun is traveling throughout the day, different colors throughout the day will illuminate that a religious space. So I try to imitate that because to me that poetically is, is working. I always put my colors the same way because it's almost like a pianist. I'll know my whites are here. I don't have to look there. So sometimes I'm just looking at my painting and not looking at my palette. Um, I wanted to share with you that I will be using an orderless turpentine and it lives in this dirty jar. And I never throw away my turpentine. One of my students, hopefully they're not watching and won't get offended, was so uh, enthused about studying with me that after the lesson, he dumped it and cleaned out my jar. And I probably had the look of Medusa when I saw it. <laughs> because the beauty of turpentine is beautiful and clean in the bottle. This is also the Talents product um, that you can get at Blick. Um, uh, the beautiful part is that the particles of paint will separate and go to the bottom of your jar while it the clean layers will clean them and sit at the top. So you can use it countless times, literally for years, but the goo at the bottom gets such a great color that sometimes you can use it for your backgrounds. So this is a real treasure. So we will be using the turpentine today to dilute the paint and you need it. In oil paint you really want to think about it as uh, watercolor and water. Do not drink your turpentine. It's not real water. It's metaphorical water. It's extremely toxic, but it acts like the water agent by uh, diluting your paint and cleaning your brushes and extremely important. The other agent that we're going to use is absolutely my favorite. And this is poppy seed oil. Most of you, if you painted with oil, you probably used linseed oil. And you can use any kind of oil as long as it dries. So don't try to use your olive oil because your painting will literally never dry. That's uh, uh, you need the artist oil to do this. So this poppy seed oil is why do I like it? Uh, if you look at linseed oil, it has a little bit of a yellow tint. It almost looks like amber and it colors the tint of your colors. It actually changes the property of how your blues and reds would look. And if we look at the bottom of this, you see how white it is. It's barely any yellow in there. So this is a great agent. It dries not fast, not slow. So it will probably take me about six or seven days to have the, my poppy seed oil dry, um, which gives me a great ability to change my mind and push my painting. Um, the other thing is that you need very little of it. So I'll use for my huge paintings, uh, I'll use this for months. So for just a few dollars, uh, this is about eight or nine dollars at Blick. Um, also, you can get all of these materials that I'm talking about on my website, zartacademy.org. I list them all um, and I think we'll share the link in just a moment. But I just have, as, despite my huge turpentine jar, this is my oil medium jar. And I, do you see how little there is? That's Great. all I need for today's painting. So this is uh, the two agents that I'll need. And the third agent I need uh, I should advertise paper towels and now I know there's a shortage of them so you could use your uh, uh, rags any kind of old t-shirt but we need a rag uh, it's equally important to hold your brushes on the, if you right hand side it uh, right side of your hand or right hand and your rag on your left hand if you don't have your rag forget it your painting will be dirty and muddy um, and not as controlled as you can I'll be dabbing into my rag throughout the painting and I'll show you what it looks like in just a moment so if you don't have any other questions we're going to shift to the painting yeah go go right ahead and uh, I'll sprinkle in some questions as we go uh, both from our own questions and from the ones from the audience so I'm going to just take a moment I'm going to bring up that uh, unfortunately I don't have a live model in the studio right now because of course of our isolation and also William lives um, uh, in the New York area. Okay, I'm just going to open my iPad because I have to bring up the photograph that I'm going to, that he kindly shared with me. William is watching this program 
So he's very brave to do this live. Okay, it's one thing to paint, it's another thing to be painted. Okay, now I'm going to uh, switch my camera. So you're gonna see my drawing that I prepared because I didn't wanna waste time with you. And it's actually a large canvas. If you look at my hand, it's not a huge canvas because we don't have that much time, uh, but it is much larger than life. And I'm also going to turn on the camera so you could still see me. So you'll see me uh, painting yes, and talking yes. to you and answering your questions. Yeah, we do see you. That's wonderful. Um, okay. Yeah, go right ahead. So I'm about to get dirty and less eloquent than I was before because what happens is when you go into painting, uh, your mind, your ability, your verbal ability shuts off. So if you think that there was an imposter before, that's, that's the reason. Um, so I'm going to start with a tool that I showed you, the Princeton tool, and I'm going to quickly turn this charcoal drawing. By the way, it's a beautiful, just so smooth surface here, and you could see that it's not white. So if I hold up my white paper towel, um, it has that neutral background that we talked about. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give the volume to this drawing very quickly with this tool. And I'm really thinking about sculpting. So if I was to touch the nose uh, around the nose bridge, that's the same way that I'm going to rotate my tool. But around the cheekbone, it goes the other way. So I'm going to touch the cheek this way, right? Or with the mustache, I want to feel the dimensionality, how it wraps around the mouth, or here, the straight down into the beard. It's a very different stroke. So you can see how my drawing is quickly transforming from something that was a little bit boring into something much more interesting and three-dimensional. Is that true or is that not happening? Oh, no, it's definitely happening. We see, <laughs> we see the dynamics of, of your strokes coming out here. So you um, see how I'm going into the wrinkle and bringing out the dimensionality of that wrinkle, flatness here and out around this way. So you see those are all different forms. These are all different sculptural forms. And what's important is not to be afraid to go into smaller details and not to treat eyes as something different. So eyes have also have to get that treatment. They can't separate. Uh, we have to, what I call, disrespect the eyes because we place such a huge emphasis on the importance of the eye that they can tend to look very separated in our paintings, but they have to be treated like everything else within the work. It's and I'm very, even going to... It's very contour line uh, uh, focused almost. Um, we do have another question from our audience, Shania. Uh, our, uh, Kyle wants to know... Uh, what colors and brands were on your palette? Uh, and you did have quite a few different colors on there. Um, I noticed something that looked like maybe a Naples yellow, uh, a yellow ochre. Tell us a little bit about the, the colors that you use on your palette and uh, the paint that you're using. Absolutely, and you're going to hear more about the colors in the moment that you ever wanted to hear because I'm going to be referring to my mixtures. Uh, but I do use, uh, can you see this, my Rembrandt paints, uh, which I discovered many, many years ago, way before that I joined as an ambassador. And I made all my students buy this paints. And then one of my students said, why aren't you an ambassador for Rembrandt? You already make us buy all of this material. And the reason that I, I love the Rembrandt paints is because the texture, the brilliance, the variety is so incredible that once you try it, you could never go back uh, to other oil paints. It's really incredible. Um, I have from titanium white, uh, I don't use zinc white, it's too translucent. I like the body in my white. And then I use what I call the poor man's white, which is Naples yellow. Mm -hmm. uh, Naples yellow is a wonderful color. I also love lemon yellow can act a little bit as a poor man's white. Now, what, why do I call it poor man's white? Because if you use a lot of white in your painting, it will become um, pasty, right? It will become washed out. And so if you go to the next shade down, which is like Naples yellow is not as brilliant, you still get the light in your painting without washing it out. Right. Uh, so then I'll always have, uh, almost always have my ochres. And uh, recently I've gotten really into the raw sienna um, and the burnt umber. So for face, it's really fantastic. And um, my friend uh, Jeff at Royal Talents talked me into uh, the permanent matter deep. And I used to be obsessed with alizarin crimson, but today he actually sent me a sample. I'm going to try it for the first time. And I'm going to compare alizarin crimson 
to this color to permanent matter deep and see if Jeff was telling the truth. He said that <laughs> that, that is I great. You'll see it here first, everyone. <laughs> and then um, I have a cadmium red on my um, uh, palette as well, which is a brilliant red. And I have um, for the darks, I have, let me switch it so you could really, really quickly see this. So you're not talking abstract, I'm not talking abstractly. Just want to point to, uh, this is one of my most favorite colors. Let's focus on this. Okay. There it goes. Uh, this is turquoise blue. Uh, now turquoise blue is one of the absolutely incredible uh, colors for shadows in a portrait. And we're going to use a lot of it. And next to it is terra verde or green earth. These two colors you can't live without as a portrait artist, in my opinion. Um, and here we have ultramarine blue and a little bit of cheating with Utrecht paint uh, with dioxide purple. So um, Rembrandt, 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 Utrecht. Gotcha. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. We love them both. That's great. Okay. So I uh, love that. That's a, it's a wonderful color. And here actually you could see alizarin crimson. Can you see it on my palette? Mm -hmm. Where I'm pointing? Yes. Yep. Uh, and next to it is the other color that I was mentioning. So we're going to compare. They look very similar. So we're going to see how yeah. they actually how they actually work. That's why I have three dabs over here. So okay. we're ready and set to go with that. So I'm just yeah, going let's, to let's back. see it in action. Um, I do have another question from the audience. Patricia wants to know if the sketch that you had on that canvas was painted in oils or done with graphite or charcoal. So yes, I used a uh, compressed charcoal, which is really, really soft black stick. And this is the reason why nobody, when I go out in social, thank God for social isolation now, because in a social situation, when I try to shake somebody's hand and I have black talons under my nails, right? It's from that charcoal. <laughs> and that's, you know, you look like a nice lady and all of a sudden you reach out with that black hand, but yeah. it comes from that soft charcoal. Um, and it gives you mobility. I like that it gets muddy and it actually, when you put brilliant colors, it muddies them a little bit, which makes it look more realistic. So it's a nice trick to go in from oil, from drawing to oil. And you're going to see in just a moment how that transposes very quickly. So why don't we use actually, what I like to use are um, Princeton brushes that are flat and long. Mm -hmm. uh, these are my favorite type of brushes. Um, size six and size eight. I'm probably going to use size eight mostly today, but I'm also going to use some house brushes. So to lay the large chunks, we're just going to use the cheapest brush you could possibly get. Um, and I'm going to start with the forehead. Wish me luck. All right. Good luck. And, and we can't wait to see it. See you on the other side. Sure. Okay. So I'm just mixing a little bit of my white and my nipples yellow, and I'll put in some of my ochres and immediately a little bit of my <clears throat> terra verde or uh, that beautiful green. And I'll need to cancel it out with a little bit of red. So what I'm, what I'm mixing is actually something that's very neutral, but takes a lot of colors to come together. And um, actually, I'm going to show you what my palette looks like really quick one more time, because I think it's helpful. So I'm uh, let's see, did I do it? Okay, go, I'm pulling from the bottom of my paints and I'm pulling, so I'm not dipping into them. I'm pulling from the bottom of my paints and I'm coming in the middle to create this mixture. So if I put in the blue and it got too blue, I need to cancel it out with a little bit of my red or a little bit of my ochre or a little bit of my green. And as a result, it's going to be a very rich color in just a moment. And even a little bit of white <clears throat> comes into action. Okay, so we're going to switch over one more time. But I think it's very helpful to see the actual mixing of the material. So we go here in the middle. And you can see how that charcoal is starting to build itself into the paint, uh, creating some, some shadows and some grayish blue tones as you go along. Isn't that cool? Very so cool. right away, I can add a little bit of red, <clears throat> since you mentioned that. Uh, to work in the red tonalities. You can actually see the picture that I'm working from <clears throat> right on the screen. Mm -hmm. yep, we can right see there. Yep. So um, there's some warmth to the right side that I'm adding and I can use my large brush. Now I'm doing a little bit of a sin today. I am painting sitting down. It is much easier to paint your large painting standing. 
and walking back and forth and really seeing what you're doing and getting kind of blind as you get closer and then revealing what you've made as you walk away from it. So painting sitting down limits your ability to express in my opinion. And plus it is a way to go to the gym. If you paint standing for about five hours, who needs a gym? So very quickly you see it's starting to um, transport itself from a drawing into a painting. Certainly. I'm not really thinking right now of a nose or a mouth or an eye. I'm thinking more like a landscape painter would. I'm thinking about the rivers and the valleys, uh, the cavities. If I was a tiny little ant, what would it take to walk across these fields or mountains? And I'm painting again from large forms to smaller forms. And we're going to take out the tool a little bit later to carve into the paint, but we need to apply at first some material, some surface to be working with. I, I also always tell myself, where am I in the face? <clears throat> am I in the front of the face or the side of the face? I actually have the words going through my mind. So right here, I'm Zhenya, you're going to the side, paint the side. So I'm not painting across and flattening the image. I'm actually traveling on it. Does that make sure. sense? Yeah, you're following some of those lines that you were starting to build up with the uh, texturing tool, the, the catalyst wedge earlier. Now, I have a little secret to tell you. Those lines that we made were for a purpose. The canvas remembers them. So when I'll spread the paint, it'll actually reveal some of those lines from the underneath. So it's not, a, it's not like we covered them up. There is a kind of a painting memory underneath I'm going to switch to a little bit smaller brush, a size size 8 brush, because we're going to get into smaller details. Now, generally, now back to how long does it take to paint. As painting this size, I need at least three hours to uh, make something coherent, satisfactory uh, of human life, three human hours, right? Because artist hours are different. Um, and so I hope that you have a lot of food and drinks because we're going to be here for a long time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're not going to be here three hours. We're only going to be a few minutes. So I just want you to be patient with me and understand that this is not going to be a finished progress, but I want to show you some particular techniques uh, that can be uh, employed, deployed. Uh, and I promise you, I'm going to make a pledge that I'm going to continue painting this once this program is over and we'll post what it looks like after a couple of hours. How's that? I think that's that's great. And, and, and you can already tell just watching you at work here how you're sort of enriching the skin and building up that, that actual skin of paint just like the skin of the individual. You're sort of layering and, and allowing those colors to, to merge and to, to play uh, in with them. Another thing that I'm, I'm noticing about your work, Genya, as you go, is that you're not painting one particular space. You're painting sort of all around, almost in a dance around the canvas. And that's something that I, uh, a lot of artists uh, I do. They, they sort of, they don't focus on an individual small area, but rather keep on going across the surface and allow those strokes to intermingle. That is so true. And I tell this to my students. I forget whose quote this is. Maybe you'll remember, Todd. Uh, there was an artist. It was either Monet or Cezanne. It's one of those two. And he said to his uh, followers and his students that you have to paint the painting everywhere at the same time. And I tell this to my students because this is really schizophrenic. How could you be painting? everywhere at the same time, here and here and here and here at the same time. But what he was trying to say is exactly what you're saying. Uh, you have to allow it to develop at a certain speed where it's like a fetus. I call it like a fetus of art, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't, when you look at the fetus on the ultrasound, you don't see first the nose, then the hand, then one finger, then another, right? You see kind of an amorphous shape developing and then uh, clear and clear as as the pregnancy goes right more and more clear you can actually see definitions of the body so i think the painting in my philosophy should imitate life it should imitate the formation of life yeah i can 
I can see how you're doing that. Um, we have another question from the audience, and uh, this is this is an interesting one. Um, with the uh, Joyce wants to know with the solid but tiny solid charcoal pieces that you have mixed into the oil paint. Uh, she's asking how archival the painting will be, um, and and I should I should say you know uh, using charcoal in in uh, the initial drawings is something that has been done for ages by artists. So this is something that is kind of a, a, a time honored technique. Yes, it's completely archival because I want you to think for a moment what is paint? Is particle of pigment like charcoal mixed in with a binder. So what you're doing is you're actually taking the pure pigment of charcoal and turning it into paint. So it's 100% archival. More archival sometimes than you want it to be. Right? Because some paintings you just want to go away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they, I've always heard, my, you know, back in the day, my painting professors told me you got to paint a good 20 paintings before you get one that's good. So. Oh, I, you know, I heard that uh, my professor said you have to make your first 6,000 mistakes before you make a good one. No, sort of the same idea. <laughs> Yours was yeah. merciful. He would say, Jenny, hurry up and make your first 6,000 mistakes. And that's what I also tell to my artists. What it really means is to get the fork. Uh, and get all those accidents out of the way and learn how to manipulate the accidents because that's really what paint is about is a lot of what you do um, is unintentional and if you can start controlling that controlling that element of chance or providing for it to happen then real magic starts to happen Another thing that's happening in your painting that, I, that I, I'm just finding so fascinating as you go is that uh, notion that we can still see sort of the quality of the brush as you go. Um, you're a painter who, who doesn't blend out every stroke that you're doing. Even though the paint is interming intermingling, you're allowing some of those paints to, uh, or some of those strokes to be uh, uh, alive and they're, they're still showing up within the body of the work. Um, that just kind of gets back to that idea of impasto from earlier. You know, you're mm -hmm. allowing those those strokes to continue to be uh, very present within the piece, and um, uh, you know, you can even see that they're you're using a flat brush here, or you're using a, a larger sort of house paint brush on the forehead. Uh, all of it is is adding to the character of the piece. Yes, I think uh, um, leaving your mark. I mean, this is really comes in to philosophy um, and we, when we go back in time the pendulum really goes back and forth making uh, this sort of like cow licked this is a Dutch term cow licked paintings you know because the Dutch have a lot of fields with cows right, right. so you see like a, as if, if imagine if the cow went and licked your canvas and it was incredibly smooth right um, to um, much more expressive and, 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 and textured quality. The pendulum swings back and forth in art, basically generation to generation. So we can see realism and expressionism going back and forth, like Renaissance and Baroque, right? Uh, very different expressions. Baroque paintings are much more layered and textured. <clears throat> uh, but at the same time, it comes to philosophy and spirituality. So the early painters, uh, for instance, like, uh, let's say Michelangelo, right? Um, not in his later sculpture, but let's take his paintings, actually, not his sculptures. Um, he's trying to show you that his idea seems to have been formed divine, divine, that it fell from God straight into his lap, and he never touched his sculptures or paintings, his early work, right? Um, and for that reason, he destroyed most of his drawings because, of course, he worked so hard working out compositions, but he didn't want anyone to think that. He wanted them, he wanted his audience to think that it was divine intervention, right? Mm -hmm. And then for somebody who, like Rembrandt, the emphasis gets switched. And um, he is thinking, he's looking, especially for a uh, um, Protestant culture. Um, the faith becomes very internalized and the artists, the Protestant artists are looking for God not in the church but within themselves. 
So they start leaving the brush marks because they think that's how, not eliminating themselves out of the painting, but actually showing their fragility and humanity is where you're going to find spirituality. So it's a very interesting shift. So and that's, uh, that's certainly something that, that uh, comes into your work quite a bit. I, I was doing a little research on you uh, before the, the discussion here, and you had a, an entire series with your uh, um, uh, model and muse, uh, Mark, um, where you incorporated him into some sort of more spiritual looking paintings. You also had a series on uh, uh, the apostles, which was interesting, mm -hmm. but kind of incorporating uh, all- For our audience, naked, naked apostles. Right, right. <laughs> all, all sorts of different nationalities and, and um, yes. you know, uh, uh, skin tones. And it was just a really wonderful series of pieces. So, um, yes, uh, let's see. I just want to show you something. So we're going to pick up the tool. Now we're going to mold the paint a little bit. We're going to start with getting a little bit more sculptural and playing with these ideas. So this is really what I would call the underpainting. This is the first layer. And it could be an hour. It could be two hours. It could be three hours. It really depends on what you're looking for. But this is all underpainting, really just basically creating the foundation, what's going to go on top. And you can see now, I took a little paint from here where I cut out, but it left a little white mark, white, white edge, and that can put a little reflected light with the same tool on the other side. And again, here, you're, you're painting all across the form as opposed to sort of diving into just one individual space. You're allowing Very that important. paint to go back and forth across the canvas. Um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, Janet would like to know uh, where you studied art. And, and I believe I, I did mention at the beginning that you uh, attended and earned your uh, degree from Art Center College of Design. But maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit more about your experience uh, in studying art. Uh, yes, so um, originally I was self-taught. Uh, because I started painting at 10. Do you see how he's kind of coming? Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, my mother took me to an art school and art schools in Russia were very rigorous. And when they looked at my work, they said that it was too old. I was, I was too old to learn. I was 10 years old because they start learning at five, like figure skaters, right? So by the time they're 10, they know all of perspective tricks. They could do all kinds of complicated compositions. And my look, my work was very naive, right? It looked more like Chagall, mm -hmm. um, like a kid would paint at 10 years old. Um, and they said it was impossible. I was a lost case and will never learn how to paint. So from then on, my mom said, great. That proves that you're an artist because yeah. artists are different. So she turned this uh, major fiasco into actually a success story in my mind. She said, now you can really learn how to paint yourself. And I, I, they, my parents were so generous. They, it was very difficult to get art supplies, but they brought me everything I needed. And for the first couple of years, I really taught myself. And I was so serious. And I was you painting. Your, you used yourself as a model quite a bit, didn't you? Exactly. I became because I wanted to be like Caravaggio. I wanted to be like Rembrandt. So I wanted to paint, you know, crucifixions and uh, mythology. And, and so I became everybody. I'm, uh, at 10 years old, I was Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. I was um, uh, Esmeralda dancing. I was, I mean, every kind of character you can come up with. I was Venus. I was uh, Toreador. Uh, depending on the artist I was looking at. I became that model. Um, of course, they look like kids' paintings, but that's what I was interested in. <clears throat> and then my mother introduced me to phenomenal two academic painters who were in their late uh, 70s or e even 80s. And they took a, like a private mentorship. Um, they were really impressed with my work and they guided me gently. And they had an incredible, incredible approach to teaching which I'd love to share. I, I, I still use this approach. Hopefully my students will agree with me. Um, what they did is they, they 
they they thought that being positive is more important than than uh, pointing out the faults. So they would look at my work, and they would really celebrate what worked, and they would explain to me why it worked, so I could recreate it again. So they would say, you know, this this portion of the face works so well because of the contrast you created here, right? And if something didn't work, they got extremely silent. And I knew there was a problem, and I had to go home and work out what the problem was. And next time, they would say, hey, look, you've solved it, and you've done this, 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 that makes it work. So they've, they've taught by incredible, loving, positive reinforcement. And as a result, there's a little voice inside me when I paint that always tells me, um, doesn't tell me something is bad. It just says, Jenny, you have to change this. You have to address this. You have to attend this, right? Um, and that little voice I plant into my student hand, uh, heads as well. They tell me that they hear my voice when they paint as well, but it's really my teacher's voice that keeps going. Now, Zenia, uh, Peggy wants to know if you're using your uh, uh, your um, poppy seed oil, or, or excuse me, your poppy oil or your uh, turpentine as you paint. Both, you must use both. So I first uh, dip my brush into my turpentine um, and then I kind of uh, take the axis off. I dab, you have to see what's happening to my rag. Um, I dab it into my rag because just a little residue of that turpentine is enough uh, to carry your brush. And then after that, I dab it, so I dab it into my cloth or paper towel. And then I dip it into my poppy seed just for briefest moments. So I, I collect like a dew, like a drop of dew. And with that, I mix my paint. And after that, it goes for quite a while. It can go for a few minutes before I have to replenish. But in order to calibrate my brush, I'm constantly dabbing into my rag to make sure that the consistency is right. And with that, I want to share something perhaps most profound about paint. I get asked a lot about my colors, but if I tell you a certain color combination and you try it and it doesn't work, don't blame me. Why? Because it's not about what you combine, it's how you actually touch the canvas. Todd, have you experienced that? That the color changes depending on your pressure? Certainly, yeah. And, and something that's interesting is when you're painting a portrait in particular, you can sort of push that paint in certain directions and by doing that, sometimes when you're overlapping, and I see you're doing this in the eye section right now, you can actually push that paint and dive into the shadows, but push the shadows in the appropriate direction while you're using a highlight uh, paint. It's really an interesting thing, but it takes a delicate touch to it. At so, the same time, yeah, at the same time, you can use a, a much stronger touch and create those sort of uh, uh, voluminous hair strands that you were doing a little bit earlier. You, you kind of build out the the um, you know the volume by by using a little more aggressive approach. So the thing is, if I had to describe that and really explain what we tried to say, you have to what I call seduce your painting. So you don't attack it; you actually caress it. And it's really important when we think about the skin that we talked about that the painting itself has a skin, and it's very sensitive to our touch. So I show you an example. Here's the, I'm going to just push white here, and then I'm going to caress it here. Look how that changes, right? It's a completely different color. Very, very so different. Um, I'm going to correct that. I don't want that here. And it's, that's another thing. Oil paint is very forgiving. So I could just tone down something or push it up and make it more intense in just moments. And notice. soften it up right there. Um, and something else that's interesting that, that I'll point out for the audience is, uh, you know, in the in the eyes, you're not uh, using a, a pure white by any means. Uh, you actually started out with uh, what appears to be a blue or, or, or a soft gray green tone uh, within the, the uh, body of the eye. And then you added some white to sort of pull out the highlights. That's one of the ways that we're able to uh, create a, a, a more wet 
looking object within the, the uh, portrait painting. Okay, I charge for that a lot of money. You just sold my te my technique. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, with all seriousness, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, the very first lesson every student in my academy experiences is that when we talk about the white of the eye, it's a problem with language because the white of the eye can never be white because the eye is set deeply into the uh, gravity of the socket right deeply into that shape so the brow casts a shadow and the white of the eye can never be white so that's exactly right great observation i started with a uh, turquoise blue mixed in with that green so i'm still using a lot of my brush and i'm going to come and carve in just a moment but we need a certain amount of paint on the canvas in order to be able to manipulate it so it kind of goes back and forth editing and subtracting how are we doing on time? What time is it? Uh, we're we're good. It's it's five o'clock now, so we're we're definitely pushing into it. But this is great. It's such an interesting thing to watch you paint. Um, Julia has a question here, and this is one that that I think every artist understands. Um, you know, we 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 talk sometimes about the happy accident, and uh, she's asking, what are some common mistakes you still make while painting, and how do you correct those? Ha, huh, that's such a good question because we try to hide that as artists, don't we? <laughs> we, do. we do. So I'm almost in denial, right? Um, because when I see them, I quickly work over them and try to pretend they never happened, right? Um, so I have to like become uber uh, self-referential and think about that for a moment. Um, okay, first of all, um, for me, you see what's happening now? How he's changing, I'm gonna give him a little closer so you could see the textures. It's certainly coming through, and you can also see some of the charcoal textures as well that you originally did. So for me, if um, I have to actually share one of my most favorite quotes, uh, which is by Van Gogh. It's on my website. It's the first thing you land on because it is the mantra. I've tattooed it in my brain. I wake up and I hear Van Gogh's voice telling me this. And what he said, if you hear the voice inside your head tell you, do not paint, then by all means paint and that voice will be silenced. Mm. So what does that mean? Uh, there's a lot of doubt when we are making art. There are tons of mistakes when we paint. Um, another Genia quote that I'll give you, you've probably heard people say there's no mistakes in art. I say there's mistakes in art and that's what makes it great. So mistakes is how we learn about what pain can do and how it can be manipulated. And a lot of times my students uh, will do a great painting and I compliment them and they say, I don't know how I did it. So a lot of it is actually just happens to them and you learn how to control that um, element of surprise. So the mistake can be positive and negative, right? And it's important that we don't let that voice tell us um, I've made a terrible mistake, now I have to retire. So it's an ability to work through it. And I'm, uh, believe it or not, I am still getting to answer this question. Um, so there is a, a kind of an element in the painting, I call it the teenage phenomenon. The painting goes through a teenage stage where it looks very contrary, rude to the artist, and ugly, <laughs> pimply. Uh, and disproportionate and if you can withstand that that teenage stage of your portrait then it will transform like ugly duckling into an amazing thing but if you're going to give up in that moment it's never going to transform so the beautiful thing about oil painting is that while you're making you're going through your teenage years um, it is transforming. So you just have to keep it in the back of your mind. Sometimes I don't even know how. It's just a matter of keep keeping at it. So I'm trying to create a little dry brush technique here for the uh, element of the hair. And the hair is layered, so it would take actually a long time to build this up, to dry and to go over and to put washes over it. But I'll just give a little indication, just the beginning of what would look like a wispy, beautiful beard. Now, I wonder if, if William is watching, if he's going to give us some feedback, what he thinks about it. 
Well, I'd certainly see here how you're sort of building it out of the the red and the the uh, what was that permanent matter tones that you were using. Yes. I I can see how the white kind of coming out of that is uh, very um, it's it's very it's very uh, in your face and sort of proud and you can you'll definitely be able to by the end of this uh, that that hair will be uh, protruding from from your background colors so it's really a, a brilliant way to, to kind of bring that in. Um, it's definitely a, a, a modeled painting already. We can certainly see how your uh, lines, your contour lines from the beginning are putting emphasis on um, the, the shape of the face and how the light is touching certain points, the tip of the nose and underneath the eyes and around that eye socket, the top of the forehead. It's really, um, it's really coming through over here. Thank you. And um, and yes, you've mentioned something that attracted me to this image because of the deep re recess of the dark in the hair and the way the forehead comes out, that contrast that you just mentioned. Um, so it's important to choose. I went for a long time back and forth thinking what image I'm going to use. And that goes into that time that we talked about how long does it take you to paint? Because choosing what you're going to paint takes a while. And that's the time spent contemplating. And you want an image that speaks to you. Not a great photograph. You don't need a great photograph. What you need is something that has a lot of, uh, if it's a photograph, if it's not a model in front of you, uh, what you need is something with a lot of detail, but also something that you could look at and see it as a painting. So if you can't see it as a painting, don't use it as a source. So if you say, oh, I wanted to paint my friend, and here's a photograph I got, and you look at it, and it doesn't speak to you, don't use it. It's a failure situation. It's not going to work. So uh, in my studio, when I teach my students, we spend a lot of time learning what's a great source image, what should be used uh, that can be successfully turned into the language of painting because what we're really doing is we're translating right certainly yeah you have to translate what's what's out there but also your painting has to to live on its own ultimately the photograph is not going to be what you see in the gallery the the image that you've painted is going to be what you see so um you know the painting has to have its own life and uh, uh really be something that that uh stands on its own well, the photograph is there to serve you, and you're not there to serve the photograph. So that's how I like to think about it. So when the time comes to change something, it's my painting that's asking me to do something that might not be in the photograph, but it's important. See, now, now it's starting to come a little personality in there, right? I can certainly see it, yeah. We, and, and the eyes are so expressive in this piece. Let's work just a tiny little bit and uh, then we'll come back to our audience if there's any other questions. I just want to work the left eye just for a moment. And I wonder if we have any more questions. Uh, we do. Uh, Charlene, uh, Charlene and, and excuse me for butchering the, uh, your name if I, if I did. Um, Charlene would like to know, what do you think about using another artist's drawing as a reference? Um, and it sounds like you, you started out uh, in, in painting, sort of copying some of the masters, but tell us a little bit about, um, have you ever used another artist's drawing as a reference to create your own unique work? You know, I actually, um, I don't, but I teach with it. Um, so for my work, I usually, I usually use live models or a photograph when I can't get a hold of my model. Um, and when, um, during the time of quarantine, I've hired my models to actually take photographs specific to the painting that we would work on. Um, and I say we, because I always feel that we're working together with the model. Um, but I teach with using the masters from 20th century masters to old masters in my classes. I only would say one thing, don't use the word copy because unless you are a forgery a specialist, you're not copying, you're learning, you're communicating, you're interpreting. So I highly recommend using drawings or paintings of other artists as a starting point because what happens, you engage in the conversation and it will never look like the work. It will still be your own. 
uh, because again, you're not copying unless you're trying to do a forgery, which I would be the worst kind of forgerer there was ever because I have too much of my own personality coming through. So um, I think it's a great practice. Uh, everybody did it. Rembrandt did it. He looked at right. Titian and right. he looked at uh, Rubens. Uh, Van Gogh did it. He looked at Delacroix. Look up uh, uh, Van Gogh's copies of Delacroix, Millet, and uh, um, uh, he did others too. He went to museums and he had his brother send him etchings, black and white etchings, because they didn't have a, obviously photography yet the way that we have a handy for reproduction. Um, and uh, he used black and white etchings for a drawing basis. And if you compare what he paints, there's a famous Pieta by Delacroix. And then Van Gogh makes his copy. Again, the word copy is probably inappropriate here. It's like a whole different painting. And even in Christ, in the image of Christ, Van Gogh paints a self-portrait. He paints a red, the only red-haired Christ you'll ever see. Uh, so very interesting how you can interpret an old master or master art in your own way. And then make it your own. Uh, we do have a couple more questions here, uh, two that are kind of related. Um, uh, Jennifer asks, uh, and this is, I love this question, uh, what do you think are the clues in a painting that tell you it's complete enough to call it done? Uh, and um, I also have another question that's related um, Michael asks, is there a point where you stop looking at the model or photo and just rely on your intuition to finish? Um, okay, and the first one was uh, when it's the, done, right? Yeah, what, what are the clues yeah. that tell you when it's done? And, uh, <laughs> I, I'd love to hear your take on that. I, I, used I to have, have three a, answers. Go ahead, go ahead. Three answers for the same question. One, uh, I love the question because uh, who's, who asked that question? Uh, that was Jennifer. Jennifer asked, Jennifer. Uh, what, what do you think are the clues in a painting that tell you it's complete enough to call it done? You know, what, uh, uh, what, why I love that, her answer is in the question. She says, uh, what are the clues in the painting when it tells you? So this is a brilliant question because uh, Jennifer is relating to a painting as if it's you, uh, alive and talking to you. So if that's so, and I believe that's so, uh, then the painting will tell you. So that is why I told you I back away. Right now it's not ideal situation, but I back away a lot from my work. I turn away from it. I walk away, then I turn back around, and then I allow the painting to talk to me. And it will say, please help me here, or don't touch here, or don't touch me at all. It literally will talk to you, I guarantee. Another two ways to answer it, uh, it was Cezanne who said it, a famous quote that I love. He said, an artwork is never finished, it is only abandoned. So literally, this process can go infinitely. It's like raising a child, right? When do you let them out into the world? It's never ending process, right? So Certainly. at some point, you have to just say, call it quits and believe in your protege, <laughs> right? That they're going to go on and, and do what they need to do because the audience will also work on your painting. It's never finished by the artist. It's really finished by the audience. You Another, know what I mean? Oh, oh definitely. I mean, uh, when, when you're painting, I, I used to have a uh, painting professor who told us that when you look at a painting, uh, you know it's finished when the the tiny man in the painting waves back to you and and the idea there was that there's not really a tiny man but the the painting has to sort of come alive for you and ultimately when you get it into the space where it's going to be hung uh everybody's going to bring their own uh, uh background to it as well and they're gonna they're gonna finish that story for you uh so that's a great way to say it um, I had, I what, what did uh, wait? What did Michael say? He said, uh, "Oh, do you ever st start look, trusting your intuition?" Right. 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 When do you stop looking at the the model or the photo and just rely on your intuition to finish? Okay, so um, it's a tricky question because actually, if you ever stopped relying on your intuition, that you shouldn't be painting. Uh, when you feel that you're just going up and down like a painting of the like a wall. 
just monotonously painting and copying, you shouldn't be painting. You should stop yourself. You should go get a coffee or a glass of wine or go for a run and come back only when you're ready to employ your intuition. So for every stroke that you do, it should be a thoughtful stroke. At the same time, you paint and control it, like right now what I'm doing, and paint and control it, but I also kind of trust my hand. And I let not my brain control it, but my, my hand kind of is on its own. And in a way, it's a little bit of an out-of-body experience where you watch yourself paint. And in such a way, it's not really you who's doing it. You're more of an observer. Um, and it's a very interesting phenomenon. I would love to work with a, a neuroscientist uh, to figure out how our brain works because I have a lot of interesting observations what we can do with our brain when we paint. Another question we have from the audience is uh, from Carrie. Carrie asks, do you have enough space in your studio to paint the really large pieces like you showed earlier? And I believe she's referencing the slideshow that you showed earlier. Right. So interestingly, I made that painting of my grandma in the smallest possible space. So don't let the space control your subject. Now, in order for me to see what I was painting, I was such a crammed little garage. Um, I had to open the door, go out to the next room, then open the door of a storage or closet, go out to that room, and then and only then I could see what I was painting. Uh, and then I would come back up close and I was totally blinded and didn't know what I was working on. And then I'd have to go back um, in the same process. So you can cram your painting in a small space. Just make sure you have good ventilation. So try to open your windows, wear uh, a special mask if it's necessary, because the fumes are not good for you in a small space. But actually, you don't need a large space to paint large paintings. It's wonderful when you do. And I want to thank my my family for building me a beautiful space but this is only a recent luxury so throughout my life I was always crammed into tiny little spaces and that's where I made my largest work all right I'm gonna put some finishing touches and then I'll come back to it on my own you can but certainly you have... see it it's 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 really coming together already so this is just what a half an hour would do so I'm gonna switch my camera for a moment. Let's see, so I can come back and see you. Uh, all right, hold on. There we are. All right. Well, thank you, Jenya, so much for uh, that demonstration. Uh, it's so clear to see uh, how dedicated you are to the art of portraiture. Um, lovely to see you kind of mix and merge those colors and really uh, show the audience how you work with the paint. Um, they're, they're, we could probably watch that for hours. So thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Uh, the, the questions that came in from the audience were, were really in interesting and uh, really uh, in-depth. And we're so grateful to the audience for watching. Uh, do you have any other parting words for the audience uh, before we sign off here? I was definitely want to uh, uh, thank you for your focus. I could feel the energy of everybody watching, and um, it felt very supportive atmosphere. I want to thank you, Todd, for for guiding us today. Uh, the Blick for hosting, Rembrandt Paints for being so delicious, Rembrandt for being such a continuous inspiration, and I definitely want to invite everybody to my website. And it's Z, like the Z for my name, Zhenya, zartacademy.org. And I really strive. I I um, I wear three hats. I'm an artist, educator, and art historian, and I also have a nonprofit. I really Bring, uh, believe in bringing free education to the public. So I put as much of free advice and videos as I can, and sometimes classes um, and different programs. So please visit and use the resources. They're there for you. ZArtAcademy.org. Art That's a place for the artists and all art amateurs and all art historians, art lovers, a place for you. Well, I'm sure that everybody in the audience will be going over there. And again, thank you so much uh, for your time today. And thank you to the audience for, for joining us today on uh, Blix Facebook Live.
And if you still have any questions, please type them up. We'll answer. And I hope to finish this and post in a day or so to show you what happened to this portrait. Thank you again, Zhenya. Have a great one.